resistance to that wall, to that barbed wire, bringing it down, is not only a right of the Palestinians who are encased inside that barbed wire, it is a duty. In the same way that prisoners of war, according to the Geneva Convention, have not only a right, but a duty to try to escape, the 2.2 million Gazans have a duty to themselves to resist and bring down, tear down that bloody wall. All right, what an honor. What an honor, ladies and gentlemen. We got Giannis Varoufakis in the building. Well, not in the building. Uh, I, or do you mind that I call you the Greek freak? Do you know what that is? The real so Greek cool. freak? Yeah, the other Giannis with two ends. Well, yeah, well, this is, uh, well, he's, um, he's a basketball player as well. There's a basketball player I they call the Greek freak. He is. Okay. All right. Well, I, I say you're the real Greek freak. Giannis Varoufakis, Fox, for those of you who don't know, former finance minister of Greece, uh, one of the founders of, uh, of uh, DM25, right? You're one of the founders of DM25. And also, uh, fun fact that many people might actually really appreciate in our community, uh, used to work at Valve and was responsible for the Valve economy. I don't know if people are going to like that about you or maybe hate you for it, but that is something that you uh, participated in back when, um, I guess, Valve was a co-op as well. I don't know if it still is. It might still be a cooperative corporation. Uh, not really. Uh, Valve today is very different to when I was there in 2011, 2012. Uh, I studied the economy and I had a great deal of fun doing that. Uh, but, uh, you know, as it so often happens, uh, the best intentions often evolve into lesser outcomes, more corporate outcomes. So I don't recognize that place the way it was back then. All right. Um, yeah, no, I mean, that's, that's just, uh, that's the, the corrosive nature of capitalism, I suspect, even though, Indeed. um, even though, you know, we're hot and cold on Gaben. Um, that's what we call him here. We're hot and cold on him. We're hot on him when he, uh, decided to, um, change the prices of, uh, video games internationally, uh, and adjust them to, uh, market rates and, and, uh, currency fluctuations in, in their respective countries. Turks love him a lot for that reason. Uh, but then I think he's changed uh, on that front as well. I myself do love the Steam Deck. I, I ride for it. I use it on a daily basis. It's my daily driver. I don't know if you know what that is. The Steam Deck is a piece of hardware that Valve created. Of course. Um, of course I think I know it's... What it was. What's up? Can you say that again? No, of course I know what it is. And oh. I have to say that Gabe, Gabe, because I know him personally, is a super smart person and a very sensitive person and a person whether you agree with his moves or disagree with his moves um his soul does not come from the united states it's an anarcho-syndicalist soul that has emerged from the black and red movement in spain without him even knowing that but then of course you know when you're embedded in a multi-billion dollar enterprise uh as i said the best intentions over the evolve into pretty terrible outcomes <laughs> if you yeah. know what i mean um but we won't talk too extensively on valve of course uh today uh we're unfortunately talking about uh something a little bit more serious than that uh although we can get back to that and i'll have you on as long as you want to be on i'm a big fan of yours for many many years uh, I, I uh, oftentimes will paraphrase some of your quotes, like uh, one of my favorite ones is when you say borders are a, a, a scar on the face of the earth. Uh, I love that one. I, I, uh, I value your perspective quite a bit. Uh, I loved when you were talking about BRICS nations. I'm going to try to not be as big as a fanboy here uh, about you in particular, even though just so this community understands, you guys in the chat understand, like, I mean, I, I think that, uh, yeah, Giannis is uh, is a legend. Um, so uh, let's talk about it. You were uh, you were slated to speak in Germany recently at uh, in Berlin at a uh, Palestinian Congress, right? Uh, it was a conference for to speak out uh, about the atrocities that are happening uh, that Israel is is perpetrating in uh, in in Gaza. And uh, the police, the Berlin police came in and uh, quickly, uh, in a very Gestapo-like way, uh, dealt with that 
Uh, they refused entry into the country for a, uh, I think it was uh, Abu Ghassan Sita, who is a uh, a British Palestinian doctor who was uh, early on in the Gaza Strip, operating in the Gaza Strip uh, as a as a healthcare professional, um, and uh, they refused entry uh, uh, into the country for him. And then they quickly and swiftly dealt with the conference. What do you what do you think about what's going on in Germany spiritually, holistically? What the hell is happening over there? And to begin with, um, thank you so much for the kind words. Uh, I don't want fans. I want comrades. This is a struggle. This is not lifestyle. This is not uh, show business. This is a major struggle for the spirit of humanity. And uh, Germany is a battleground because once again, a proud nation, a proud people, the German people, uh, are being dragged by their political regime, not just the government, but the whole of the spectrum of the political personnel, including their media, of course. They're being dragged into yet another genocide in their name with their complicity, uh, as if the genocide of the Palestinians, rivers of Palestinian blood, can wash off their guilt over the Holocaust. It can't. And this is why, uh, months ago, Together with uh, the very brave comrades in Germany of the Jewish Voice for Peace, for a Just Peace, uh, with whom we have worked to organize the Palestine Congress, uh, along with Palestinian organizations, uh, NGOs, uh, you know, progressive people who are not uh, lulled into silence by fear or propaganda. Uh, we put together that Palestinian Congress, and since we are not in, in a great hurry, let me give you the background, because I think the background is, is important. Well before last week's uh, Gestapo-like German police intervention, I, the first time I knew that there was, there, was, there was going to be a problem with this Congress, which I was going to be a speaker, but I was also one of the organizers, it was about a month ago, because I received a very weird email from my German publisher, a very good publishing house called Kunstmann, uh, who have published six, seven books of mine in the past, have been very supportive, even in difficult times when I was the finance minister of Greece and I was clashing with the German government. So, you know, decent people, decent people sending me an email, uh, which was completely out of character for them. Essentially, they were telling me, telling me as my publishers in Germany to stay away from this Palestine Congress. That's a month before it happened. And it was weird because, as I've said, it was out of character. And secondly, why would they be doing this? How would they know about it? We had not even publicized it yet. You can imagine why. Because the police and the security forces had actually gotten to them. And they said, you know, if, you, if you want to sell Yanis's books in Germany, you, have, you better persuade him to stay away from this. I, at the time, I didn't know that. I was simply peeved with my publishers and I simply discontinued my relationship with them. Because when I said to them, hang on a second, you feel confident enough to tell me where to speak and where not to speak? And they came back with a second very aggressive email saying, if you, if you want your new book, which is coming out in September in Germany, to do well, you, you've got to stay away from this Congress. It doesn't matter what the Congress is about. Just stay away. And I just told them to F off, essentially. And I knew then that that Congress would not go well. Now, at around the same time, I hope I'm not boring you with that. Just no, interrupt no, no, me if I, if I'm going on for too long. Um, British... Uh, Philosopher and filmmaker Raul Martinez has made uh, a six part documentary uh, on the economic crisis, on from the rise of fascism, on uh, need for internationalism. And it features me. I'm the center of that documentary. Why am I saying that? Because Raul Martinez booked the great Babylon Theater in the center of Berlin to have the launch of the movie, of the documentary. And I was invited. And that was around the same time that my publisher were warning me against the Palestine con Congress of last week. And to my astonishment, I found out when I arrived in Berlin that the police had threatened, threatened the proprietor of the Babylon Theater that if he doesn't cancel our event, uh, then uh, all sorts of horrible things will happen because Yanis is an anti-Semite and a lot of anti-Semites are going to, to gather. And you know, thankfully, uh, the proprietor of Babylon is a Jew. And the Jew who takes yeah. no bullshit. 
and he told the police to get you know to, 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 to stuff their <laughs> their advice and their threats and we we had the regime the the, 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 the launch of the of so I knew that something was afoot in Germany and then there were lots of attempts to cancel our event the bank account of the Jewish Voice for Peace in Germany, which is a German organization in German, German Jews, their account was frozen by the state. So here is the German state confiscating the money of Jews again in the name of fighting <laughs> anti-Semitism. Yeah. Um, around the same time, you may have heard of a wonderful woman who lives in, in Berlin. Her name is Iris Hefetz. Uh, she's a psychanalyst, an Israeli Jew who lives in Berlin. She's a comrade of ours. She staged a protest, a one-woman protest. I don't know whether you heard about that. Uh, it was a remarkable moment. She was walking down the street on her own, and she had a placard. Simply, she had written herself and said, as an Israeli and as a Jew, stop the genocide in Gaza. And a white Aryan German policeman arrested her for anti-Semitism. Just like with yeah. Uri, right? Uh, who who was also was I don't know if it's the same cop, but it the, the, is it is uh, the the optics of it as well. And I know liberals care about optics more than anything else. Uh, the optics of it as well were very shocking to see this like blonde Donald Trump looking German oaf uh, arresting a Jewish man with a with a yarmulke uh, on as well. And yes. you know they just they they don't really care about it at all. I guess. Yeah, they, it's it's just absurd. I think I think they're digging their own hole now. The German system, the the, the German regime, and they don't even realize it. Uh, but that's another question. Okay, so so let me let me end the the long story as briefly as I can. So on the day of the Palestinian Congress, as you said, the Vice Chancellor of Glasgow University, who's a British Palestinian surgeon, uh, not just a British Palestinian surgeon who has spent forty five days in the trenches, in the hospitals, uh, operating on, on, you know, amputating people and so on. But also he is the vice chancellor, the president in American terms of the University of Glasgow, one of yeah. the most renowned universities. So the, he was uh, um, essentially deported back to Britain. Uh, that day was worse than death, in my opinion. Yes. And, and you know, our little Congress uh, venue surrounded by two and a half thousand German police, two and a half thousand German police for 500 of, of my colleagues. Uh, most of them were harassed. They were not allowed to get in. One of the young Jewish protesters who had his own little placard which read Jews against genocide was apprehended. At that point, because he is a humorful guy, he said to them, would it have been okay if it read Jews in favor of genocide? At which point they hit him because they got annoyed with him. And he, he ended up in a prison cell. Um, in the end, the Congress gets uh, underway. At some point, the police bust in, they grab the microphones, they tear them up, up, apart. They <laughs> Another small but telling detail, if this was a movie, it would have been a good scene. Uh, they try to get into the, the room, where uh, the technician's room, where the servers were supporting the live streaming. And one of our organizers was actually giving them the key to get into that room, and they yeah. defused it. And they used uh, force to break down the door instead, even though we were giving them the key. In other words, this was a declaration that they wanted force, they wanted violence, they wanted to create a climate of fear. Anyway, that happened about 30 minutes before I was due to speak over Zoom. I was in here in Greece. Uh, and of course I couldn't because the live stream was discontinued. So what I did was, as I'm sitting here talking to you, I recorded my speech on my computer. I uploaded it on, on my blog. And clearly the authorities were not particularly pleased by that. So the next day there was a demonstration by our organizers and a police constable approaches our organizers and warns them against my voice being heard over the loudspeakers of the organizers because there was uh, an order by the Ministry of the Interior to ban me not only from entering the country but also from entering the country digitally or through audio files even if they were pre-recorded which you know the mind ogles 
<laughs> absolutely boggles. Since then, um, the, the government has uh, managed to lie to the German people, to the public generally, to me, in writing at least three or four times. First, they denied that there was a ban on me. Then they said there was a ban on me. Then they said they were going to give me in writing the reasons for the ban, because I've never been presented with anything in writing explaining the ban. And now, today, I received a letter from the German police, the National Security Department, which is eerie the moment you hear the National Security Department of the German police, right? <laughs> your hair stands on end, even though I don't have much. Um, <laughs> And uh, it, it read that, uh, yes, we told you that we would give you the reasons for your ban, but we're not going to, because uh, doing so would jeopardize the capacity of the German state to coordinate with other security and intelligence services in order to prevent national security threats to the Federal Republic of Germany. So this is where we are. Yeah. Um, uh, similar thing has occurred here in the United States of America and has occurred time and time again. Maybe not to the same severity as the German government because we do at least have like freedom of speech, which uh, the way that people advocate for it is oftentimes for uh, opening up spaces to more reactionary thinking and more reactionary thoughts. But in, in some respects, there's a little bit more of an allowance for, um, I guess, radical outside of the box thinkers uh, it, under normal circumstances, like uh, criticism of Israel do not get met with, uh, in normal circumstances at least, do not get met with uh, criminal liability, criminal punishments. However, um, our universities, which are supposed to be battlegrounds for free speech and and ideas to, to test their mettle in the marketplace of ideas, have uh, seemingly uh, shut off one type of information from public discourse pretty desperately. An example I... Uh, obviously would bring would like to bring up now is columbia university i don't know if you're familiar with what's going on with the student protesters out there student um they disbanded uh a lot of the groups including jewish voice for peace and they yeah. suspended a bunch of students including uh, uh overnight taking away uh their their access into residential halls leaving them stranded in the middle of new york and also on top of that mass arrested a bunch of uh campus uh demonstrators there's another example from USC with a valedictorian who, uh, in almost uh, an incredibly ironic way, a valedictorian who uh, minored in, and this is the USC's own terminology for it, uh, resisting genocide studies. Because at the USC, uh, they don't, it's not just called genocide studies, it's called resisting genocide studies, which she had minored in, uh, a hijabi student, uh, was denied. Uh, her uh, right to do a valedictorian speech, as is customary, uh, under normal circumstances, denied for security concerns, similar to what the German government told you. Uh, of course, this is the very same USC campus that has uh, been a hotbed of conversation about how Milo Yiannopoulos has to come on campus, and and he did. Uh, uh, ben Shapiro has come on campus and delivered speeches uh, with police protection, mind you. But of course, when it's a valedictorian who is going to maybe mention Palestine, well, that's too much of a security uh, breach for uh, the USC campus, for, uh, I guess, USC donors in general and the alumni uh, that they had to cancel their speech. So the, the obvious hypocrisy was always uh, uh, pretty apparent to those who have been paying attention to the plight of Palestinians for, uh, you know, many, many decades. Uh, I've routinely brought this up as a counterpoint to the likes of Barry Weiss, who fancy themselves to be champions who have uh, champions of free speech, who have tailored their entire right wing uh, uh, commentary around, even when they were at the New York times around how they are advocates for free speech. And that's why we have to, allow these like super far right speakers on campus who also uh, personally uh, would do everything in their power and Ben Shapiro as well, do everything in their power to, to stop any kind of uh, student activism from ever happening on college campuses, even before uh, this new post October seven environment that we're in uh, going as far as collaborating with Can uh, Canary mission, which is a doxing operation uh, and, and, uh, you know, utilizing uh, the deans and, and utilizing uh, university administrators to to 
basically suppress any kind of uh, pro-Palestinian sentiment. Um, so, you know, the situation has been really bad for a very long time. However, I guess one thing I wanted to talk to you about was uh, maybe maybe pulling ourselves out of uh, this conversation for a second and thinking about a broader picture here, because things have been very different since October 8th. Uh, now we're in, we're in the seventh month of the uh, seemingly endless ethnic cleansing campaign in Gaza, but public sentiment has shifted dramatically uh, in the direction of of recognizing Palestinians as humans, and also even dare I say, advocating for Palestinian emancipation. Um, what do you think about all of this? I have to say that um, the seventh of October. Even though it uh, triggered massive death and suffering, and that includes the twelve hundred uh, Israelis, but yeah. now we have you know thirty five thousand Palestinians uh, whose life uh, has been snuffed out, and we have, in particular, you know the, the thousands and thousands of, of uh, uh, Palestinian injured children, no surviving parents. That idea, you know, of uh, kids uh, surviving in the rubble on their own, burying their siblings uh, with their the rotting cor corpses of their parents in the vicinity, that, that simply surpasses anything that the human spirit can sustain. Nevertheless, as somebody who has been to Gaza in previous decades, who's been to the West Bank, who has seen the ironclad apartheid state in all its brutality, even when nobody gets killed, just watching a queue, a line of people trying to cross um, a checkpoint in near Chalkidia or Ramallah in order to go to the hospital, in order to go to their work and to sustain the ritual humiliation of the agents of the apartheid state, which is uh, which has been established now for decades. Before the 7th of October, let us not forget, 60% of children in Gaza were malnourished. That's before the 7th of October. Uh, the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians in East Jerusalem was uh, running at a very fast pace. Similarly, in the West Bank, the settlers uh, were constantly, constantly eradicating whole villages under the IDF's uh, supervision and assistance. The Arab states, the Arab states that had sold their soul to the devil long, long time ago, and here I mean the United Arab Emirates, and Saudi Arabia, Jordan, and so on. And they the were devil turning being in... Western capitalist imperialist interests in the region, specifically yes, America. Okay. Totally, in the pockets of, uh, of of American capital, not even European capital. Uh, and, you know, they, they were quite happy to allow the Palestinian people to be ethnically cleansed as long as there was peace and quiet. Uh, you, you saw that the United Arab Emirates uh, established dem dem uh, diplomatic relationships with, uh, with Israel, uh, no conditions attached regarding even a discussion of the so-called two-state solution. Saudi Arabia was coming next. At least now, the blood of so many people has given rise to exactly as you put it, to a change of heart, especially amongst the youth in the United States and everywhere yeah. else. And to allude to something you were saying earlier, to the restrictions in free speech and generally uh, in, 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 a, in, a, in the capacity of the American people to discuss sensibly and with a modicum of um, mindfulness, the question of universal human rights from the river to the sea. It reminded me, as you were speaking, of the great Edward Said, who once commented that unless the Palestinians are liberated, it is the Americans who will remain in a state of pseudo-democracy. That's interesting. Um, I think that, I mean, <laughs> I do think that America is in a state of pseudo democracy, even uh, outside of the the Palestinian question. Um, I think it's a it's it's very prescient. The Golda Meir quote that I bring up quite a bit, I think, is uh, flipped on its head. Uh, do you know the one I'm talking about, where she says something along the lines of like, 
Um, Palestinians will never know peace until they learn to love their children more than they hate Jews. And I think that that is much like many of the things that uh, Zionists uh, have said time and time again about like both the inception of the state of Israel and the defenses for why Israel must maintain an apartheid um, has always been a case of pure projection. Like I've never seen something so perfectly uh, devoid of, of, of any kind of logic and just like almost entirely flipped on its head where I think that there's truth to what Goldemeyer is saying. As long as you flip the script, flip the narrative and, and talk about how Israel will never know peace until they learn to love their own children and want to protect them more than they want to kill Arabs and Palestinians as a whole. And I think that uh, what you brought up as far as uh, 60% of Palestinian children uh, facing malnourishment uh, that predates October 7 and the, the subsequent siege that occurred and is still ongoing is a perfect demonstration of why October 7 happened to begin with. This does not make it right. This does not make it good. It is still a tragedy. There were still acts that uh, certainly could be clarified as acts of terror, considering that, uh, you know, there were civilians who were targeted and killed in the process. Um, however, um, it was, while it was unprecedented, it was not unexpected in any uh, sense of the word. You cannot push people into a corner, back them, jail them, humiliate them for 75 years, and, and expect them to be servile and expect them to not want to resist. It's a very normal human condition, um, something that gets lost in this conversation, I think. Having said that, however, um, I want to move on to, I guess... Now that we've discussed uh, the the changing of the narrative, especially amongst the youth, um, some of the ways in which our um, are some of the ways in which our organs of propaganda are are reacting to that change, and I do feel like there's a sense of desperation here, especially as it pertains to like the TikTok ban. The TikTok ban has been a very pressing point of conversation. They've uh, They've brought it up on numerous occasions. Now APAC has also involved themselves in trying to get uh, TikTok banned. Uh, there was a leaked audio of of uh, the, the president ADL, uh, which uh, for those of you who don't know is the Anti-Defamation League, but I like to call it the Apartheid Defense League, um, had, had uh, been talking warning about how TikTok was brainwashing the youth into repeating Hamas and Iranian propaganda, as he said. Those were the words he used. And now American Congress, both uh, for financial gain and also now as a matter of, in their opinion, national security, want to move the ownership of TikTok away from ByteDance and, and give it to the hands of a trusted American capitalist instead. Um, do you think that that will, uh, do you think that there's any chance that that something like this would pass? I mean, what does that say about American hypocrisy as far as uh, free speech? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Of course, there is a very strong chance it will pass. I'll be surprised if it doesn't pass. But Hassan, allow me, I need to make a point regarding the storming of the wall of the wall of shame around Gaza on the 7th of October. Yeah. Because uh, one of the reasons why I'm being vilified and disinvited and demonized here in Europe, at least, is because on the 8th of October, I made a very... Uh, staunch separation um, between two separate issues. One is the atrocities that were committed by members of Hamas against civilians. I condemn every single atrocity, whomever the perpetrator might be or the victim. But I've separated that strictly and staunchly from the resistance, the armed resistance to an apartheid system designed as part of a slow-burning, inexorable ethnic cleansing program, which involves creating, back in 1948, the open concentration camp, which is the Gaza Strip. Resistance to that wall, to that barbed wire, bringing it down, armed resistance to that, is not only a right of the Palestinians who are encased inside that barbed wire, it is a duty. In the same way that prisoners of war according to the Geneva Convention, have not only a right, but a duty to try to escape. The 2.2 million Gazans have a duty to themselves to resist and bring down, tear down that bloody wall. That is a separate issue 
from the condemnation of attacks on civilians. I need to be very clear on this. Let's yeah. go back to TikTok. <laughs> no, uh, well, TikTok. you and I are both uh, uh, on the exact same page. I, I always uh, make this separation that, like, although terrorism is a political designation for non-state actors, regardless of ideology, regardless of what their cause is, whether it's moral or immoral, just or unjust, um, ultimately, the way I classify our understanding of uh, what it means to do terrorism colloquially, I classify that as targeting civilian populations, regardless of, uh, you know, devoid of political ideology. I think that that is the line that must be drawn in these circumstances. And uh, so I do agree with you on what you said uh, as well. That was uh, something, I, I said something similar on October 8th as well. Didn't stop everybody from still pouncing and saying that, uh, I love decapitating babies and, and that I am Hamasabi. Me also being from a Muslim background as a Turkish person, by the way, sorry, um, I am I am Turkish. I don't know if you know that. <laughs> but, uh, I be, know that. I appreciate <laughs> that. In Listen, you and I are post-Ottoman. That's what we are. We share our post-Ottoman identity. It's true. My, <laughs> my grandparents are uh, on my father's side are from Selanik and uh, Crete, actually. So, although I've never well, been to we, Greece. We are a very good example of ethnic cleansing. <laughs> uh, the Greeks ethnically cleanse the Turks, and the Turks ethnically cleanse the, cleanse the, the Greeks. And the result is that we are both poorer for this. Yeah. Well, I mean, but also we do have a lot of shared history and shared culture. I always joke about how, like, it's impossible to distinguish between Greek villages and Turkish villages. The only major distinction is, like, language and religion, which seemingly are big barriers for a lot of people. It's a hang up for many people, even though we are obviously aligned as uh, we're obviously aligned on class interests more so than anything else, uh, as you and I both understand and recognize. Um, even culturally, I think Greek people and Turkish people are very similar, food similar, people look the same, people have similar vibes in general. We are the same, we are the same. And yeah. I have to tell you that, that my Turkish comrades in Turkey, and I have a lot of them, uh, who are fighting for the same causes that we are fighting here in Greece, you are fighting in the United States, and sometimes under harsher conditions, uh, are the people that I admire the most. And unless we manage to uh, join hands uh, across the Aegean Sea, uh, neither Greece nor Turkey will be free. Yeah, agreed. Um, but yeah, going back to the TikTok ban, let's talk about let, that. Let, let, let me tell you about what I... What I believe about it, and, and this is something which, which is very close to my heart, because I, I've recently in the United States published, let me plug my recent book called Techno Feudalism, What Killed Capitalism. Uh, in it, I, um, I delve into what I consider to be the most interesting economic and socioeconomic uh, transformation of the last 10 years. We have a new form of capital, which I call cloud capital. It's what lives in your phone. TikTok is one example, but so is Google and so on and so forth. My hypothesis, Hassan, is that um, this is a, a unique form of capital. Capital so far, up until we had uh, you know, algorithmic capital or cloud capital, as I call it, they, what was capital? It was produced means of production, things that you create in order to build other stuff. Like, you know, you have a tractor in order to produce corn. You have a steam engine in order to produce textiles. but with what lives inside TikTok, what lives inside YouTube or Facebook or Amazon.com for that matter, it's a produced means of behavior modification, not of producing anything. You know, Jeff Bezos is not producing anything. He's just produced the capital with which he has created a fiefdom in which he encases buyers and sellers. He doesn't produce anything himself, but he charges 40% rent on the product, on the deals that uh, are struck by buyers and sellers. And anyone who owns that cloud capital is immensely powerful. They have a, re a remarkable new powers to extract value from others, whether they are proletarians, petit bourgeois, even small scale, old fashioned capitalists. Why am I telling you all this? Because if you think about it, there are two locations on the planet where cloud capital is concentrated. Europe doesn't have any, India doesn't have any, Africa doesn't have any. It's the United States and China. 
Why did Donald Trump start the Cold War, the new Cold War between the United States and China? It's not Taiwan. Uh, yeah, this is a very boring, a very lazy expl explanation. China's position on Taiwan never changed. It's not the, the fact that the Chinese are spying on the Americans, as if the Americans are not spying on everyone. Uh, it's not the military built-up of China. Until I see military naval vessels of the Chinese uh, Navy patrolling California or, you know, just outside uh, uh, Virginia, uh, it's really unbelievable that they are worried about the Chinese military prowess. No, it's because the Chinese have developed their own big tech and they have an advantage over the American big tech. And let me tell you what my hypothesis as to the, the, the nature of that advantage. In the United States, you have Silicon Valley, big tech, and you have Wall Street, two centers of massive power. Wall Street extracts huge financial rents from the rest of the world, primarily, of course, the United States, and big tech extracts what I call cloud rents, algorithmic rents, call them if you want, right? The two of them, though, have not merged because Wall Street will never allow Apple or Google to take over its capacity, you know, Goldman Sachs or JP Morgan's capacity to extract financial rents. So cloud capital and financial capital in the United States are divided and in, in a kind of rivalry. In China, they have merged under the Communist Party. Their cloud capital and their finan uh, financial system have been merged. There is this app called WeChat, before we go to TikTok, which provides free banking to everyone. Free banking to everyone. You can make transactions to anybody independently of where, where they are banking. Imagine that the United States Wall Street will never allow that. Well, In Elon Conjunct Musk wanted to do that. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah, He's not. Course, not but, but Goldman Sachs will not allow him. Well, Goldman before Sachs, Goldman Sachs, I think his own incompetence will never allow him. But that's besides the point. Well, yes, indeed. Even if you had the most competent version yeah. of Elon Musk. Yeah. Wall Street would, would, would murder him, would find a way of uh, annihilating him. Whereas in, in, in China, they have merged. Add to that the fact that the Chinese central bank is, is now providing, did you know that? It, it's providing free digital wallets to everyone who wants them. Even you, you can have one. You don't have to be Chinese. And with that, you have free transactions huh? in one, of course. Now, so far, this is not a threat or hasn't been a threat to the preponderance of the power of the American dollar because the Chinese capitalists themselves want dollars and they want the dollar system. They do not yeah. want the one system. But the war in Ukraine, by confiscating $400 billion of Russian money, the United States and the European Union, it has created a lot of interest in Saudi Arabia, in the United Arab Emirates, in Indonesia, amongst oligarchs. Russian oligarchs, of course, but some Ukrainian oligarchs too, too, in putting their money in the Chinese system, you know, as a hedge in case the Americans get pissed off with them and confiscate their money in the way that they, they confiscated the Russian money. So that capacity of Chinese cloud capital and cloud finance to create a clear and present danger to the monopoly of the international payment system based on the dollar. The SWIFT is what, is what you're talking about, right? Like, I mean, the, the financial transactions being made on the dollar. Yes, and don't let anyone tell you that SWIFT is European. It is formally European. It's completely controlled by the United oh, yeah. States. Donald Trump switched it off like that against Iran when he, he felt like it against the, 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 the advice and the wishes of Angela Merkel and the whole of the European Union. Oh, yeah. So the reason I'm saying that is because it, Donald Trump started a new Cold War because the people around him, not himself, the Donald can't think strategically to save his life, but the people around him, and they're not all dumb, uh, it's a big mistake to think that they were dumb, they could see that the Chinese agglomeration of cloud capital and financial capital was presenting a, a clear and present danger to the monopoly of the dollar, which is the only reason why the United States can have huge deficits and still increase its hegemony around the world, the American dollar and its monopoly. You could see that the Chinese are, were about to create a superhighway, digital superhighway of payments that was competing with the American dollar. And they started what? With banning Huawei, then ZTE, remember, then um, these very quite large uh, tariffs on uh, Chinese exports. And then Joe Biden comes in and turbocharges the new Cold War by banning micro, advanced microchips from going to China. Why? 
in order to slow down the development of this super highway, digital highway of, the, uh, uh, of, of Chinese financial and big tech capital. TikTok is, was always going to be one, you know, Donald Trump has been talking about TikTok a long time because it's part of this attempt to bring down Chinese big tech. Because as I said, it is only Chinese big tech which has a, you know, a, a, a very able um, competitor to Google, to Facebook, to Instagram, to all that. Nobody else does. So TikTok was always going to be targeted. Then comes Gaza. And I'm sure you have experienced that. My tweets on Gaza are not seen by anyone. I have 1.2 million followers. Uh, Almost no one sees my tweets because the algorithm owned by Elon Musk makes sure that when I tweet something about Gaza, you know, me and my dog only hear it or hear the, the tweeting sounds. But TikTok <laughs> is very different because they cannot control it. So they already had a reason to ban or take over Americanized TikTok. Uh, and now they have an even greater one and they never let a little crisis like Gaza go to waste when they have a long-term new Cold War program for defunking Chinese big tech. But I don't think they will manage to do it, even if they take over TikTok in the United States, even if they ban it. I think the United States establishment is on a losing streak. Yeah. Um, no, I, I absolutely agree. I think one of the reasons for that um, is because... And I guess I hate to admit this, but like um, the the Dengist Gambit, as I like to call it, uh, is a very successful one because um, the greatest weakness that uh, Western liberal capitalist democracies uh, presents is their actual biggest strength, uh, the strength of of like social liberties, civil liberties to a certain degree, of course, but more importantly, treats the treat economy, as uh, Matt Chrisman used to call it. Uh, of travel trap house the idea that like um we love treats and that is uh that has a sedating effect on on all americans all people living in the western world that like their you know government interference with our treats can can uh never happen that we will get very upset especially here in america like a big part of the covid lockdown protests originally were not on the virtue of like oh we can't get money we can't work but it was actually about like not being able to get a haircut not being able to go to Applebee's. And uh, while it seems really silly, I think that our appetite for that sort of thing was uh, very, very usefully uh, weaponized, I guess, in some respects, by uh, the, the, uh, by the Dengis government at the time. Uh, and, and that paired up with obviously the interests of capitalists that were consistently in the face of, of profit rates uh, uh, declining. Uh, wanted to squeeze out as much profits as possible by outsourcing labor to China, which was going to be very cheap. So that I think was uh, was was obviously very successful in in bringing about this uh, incredibly prosperous Chinese development over the course of the past couple of decades. And I think a very similar dynamic exists within TikTok as well. Obviously, social media is heavily regulated internally in China. TikTok doesn't exist in China. They have Douyin. They have a different uh, version of TikTok in China. Um, and yet, uh, they have a very valuable Western-facing product that America only makes up, I think, like 10% of the market share on, which or, or the user base on. I'm sure that like they probably generate a lot more value from the American market in general. But um, overall, it's uh, it has been phenomenally successful because it offers in the simplest terms what americans want to see it's very good mm -hmm. at giving you exactly what you want to see it's very good at being addictive the the lack of restriction and the lack of regulation that is at the core of i guess like american identity american individualism um is what is inevitably causing our own downfall in many respects if you were to think about tiktok as though it's like a is a very successful uh, product, a successful product that does not exist in China, and the the uh, the very same product exists very differently in China. As a matter of fact, does that make sense? In, absolutely, absolutely. The small mercies uh, in Western life that you describe as treats uh, have always been 
marketized and commodified superbly by American conglomerates, whether this was Coca-Cola or uh, McDonald's or uh, Hershey's or whatever. We've seen this in Mad Men with Don Draper doing a fantastic job at commodifying all this, you know, commodifying nostalgia, commodifying the need for escapism and all that. Meanwhile, the, the deal between the United States and China that Washington understood as the backbone for the great friendship, the, the loving between Washington and Beijing, beginning with Nixon in Beijing, the American, the American authorities thought of it as a straightforward, old-fashioned trade thing. You know? Aluminium is produced no longer in the United States, it's produced in Shanghai, it's shipped over, it goes through the process of the, the customs office, uh, the, the American government can control the tariffs, it can control uh, how much aluminium goes in, they can slow down the degree to, you know, the, the speed at which aluminium is going into the, into the United States. In other words, it's done under the terms of the United States. Uh, the, the, the Chinese capitalists producing the aluminium depend on the dollar. They keep their money in Wall Street, they buy real estate in Miami, so they are controlled. They, they, ha they are forced, essentially, because they have no other alternative to buy U.S. Treasury bills. Essentially, the Chinese profits become uh, a fund, uh, a slush fund for the American government to run large deficits. It's, it's, it's a beautiful deal for the United States. And it's not just Fantastic. the Chinese profits, though. It's, it, this exists for every uh, citizen, sure. as long as they're rich capitalists. Like, uh, and, and the reason why I mention that is because there's a lot of xenophobia in America, and like the Chinese... Uh, the Chinese investments are still, I think, like 17 on that long list of other nations that like buy land or other nations that buy capital in general in America. Yes, they are very heavily restricted on what they can buy by the United States. They, they, they have to keep their money in the dollar system, but they have, you know, if, if they try to buy Google, they will, they will not be allowed. Even the J Japanese now are not allowed to buy you know, st the US a steel, steel. companies. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, but uh, here is the great contrast between aluminium, which I use as an example. I could have used cars. I could have used uh, clothes, textiles, whatever. TikTok is very different because TikTok is not produced in China. TikTok is produced by you guys in the United States because you know the the, the capital that is necessary to create TikTok is tiny. You know, of course, by my, your standards and mine is large, all the servers and the stuff. But in terms of, you know, the greater scheme of things, there's not that much. Yeah, it, it was a very clever algorithm. But how much did it cost? A minuscule amount in comparison to how much it takes to, to produce aluminium and send it over to the United States and so on. Right. And who is the real producer of the capital stock of TikTok? You are. Every time you upload a video on TikTok, you are adding to the cloud capital of TikTok. And that maddens the American authorities because here you have a business model, a Chinese business model, which operates in the United States. It doesn't have a production, productive base in China, but it amasses monies, which in a manner, through a process which is not under the control of the customs office, of the IRS, of uh, the Trade Department of the United States, of the FDC, of, of, of the Federal Reserve. And, and that, to them, is anathema. They would love to have it in China, <laughs> uh, but they are loath to allow the Chinese to have it in the United States. Yeah, we get, you can't make our citizens your digital serfs. Only we get to do that, is what you're saying. Yeah, absolutely. As absolutely. a surf myself, because I, I am very much a part of, obviously, techno-feudalism, uh, my rent seeker being Jeff Bezos here on Twitch, because this is an Amazon-owned platform, uh, I am consistently giving uh, a percentage fee for being able to operate on the internet in the way that I do uh, back to Twitch, and by way of Twitch, back to Amazon, back to Jeff uh, Jeffrey Bezos. Um yeah, I, I I see the point that you're you're making. Um, I agree with you. I don't know if TikTok will be banned though, because I think that, like I said, it is a very powerful. The only tool of resistance that the Americans successfully ever deploy 
against uh, uh, centers of power is when their treats are taken away. Like, because this entire project relies on you having unrestricted, unfeathered access to said treats, including uh, uh, TikTok, including but not limited to TikTok. And once those things get taken away, people get very, very upset. Um, so I, I don't but know. That's why ByteDance, the owner, the Chinese owner of American TikTok, would be mad to divest. They should uh, throw the ball in the court of the United States authorities and say, you, if you want to ban us, ban us. We're not selling. Yeah. I mean, that's why would they? It's a very powerful tool in general. I don't think they're going to, I don't think they're going to sell. I, I think that they are going to, yeah, they're going to, they're going to force the American government to make a very unpopular decision that uh, many, not just like random people that enjoy TikTok, but also many small business owners are going to be frustrated by. Because the reality is um, that there are a shit ton of small business owners because it's like one of the only viable uh, uh, economic forms of upward social mobility, which is basically just a forgotten dream for many Americans, but that it's small business ownership in the form of, uh, uh, in the digital space, like selling t-shirts and whatnot. This is like Indeed. one of the last bastions of the, uh, of being able to realize some semblance of the American dream. Uh, one of the last avenues where you can do that. You're absolutely right. And at the same time, let's not forget uh, what my friend Cory Doctorow says about Amazon and American conglomerates in the big tech space. Uh, he has a fantastic word, I'm sure you know it, the process of entitification. So Amazon began, and Facebook, began by being nice, both to users and to, to sellers, to publishers, for instance, people like yourself, or newspapers, or small businesses, until they became absolutely, these small businesses and publishers and users became completely uh, beholden to the platform, utterly dependent on it. And then they started piling shit on them and essentially blackmailing them. Uh, you will not appear in the first 20, um, even if people want to see you, unless you pay us. Uh, and TikTok hasn't done that, at least not yet. So I'm reinforcing your point that small businesses that have been completely exploited and they hear the word Amazon and they freak out, uh, if you take away TikTok from them, uh, given that it's their last resort, they will be particularly peeved. But then again, the United States authorities have shown in the past a remarkable capacity to you know, treat Americans like fodder and then not to pay the price for it because the fodder simply stays at home, privatizes their fear, licks their wounds, and accepts their circumstances. Yeah, uh, the, the thing that you're mentioning is also a byproduct of monopolization. I feel like all matter of tech, especially because it's like a new frontier to some, or was a new frontier when the, uh, when the, the, uh, when Silicon Valley was expanding, I guess. Uh, that uh, they did the exact same thing that our barons, our, our oil barons and our steel barons did and tried to very quickly seize up as much territory, expand uh, vertically and horizontally and monopolize as quickly as possible. And it's like, it's not even really a secret. Uh, it is very much the uh, stated goal of every single one of these Silicon Valley unicorn companies such as Uber. The entire goal is that you know, we're a tech company, we're going to go get, uh, we're going to get into the market, we're going to bring a, a valuable disruptive product, and that disruption is only in the form usually of like a little bit of new um, technological uh, uh, advancements, but a lot of disruption to the uh, labor regulatory process, which is already very anemic here in the United States of America. Because like, what did Uber actually do? I mean, it disrupted the medallion structure, it disrupted regulations for cab drivers, and, uh, and and it took advantage of a new class of gig economy workers that were desperately looking to make extra money uh, so they could uh, keep up with uh, the increasing prices and and worsening living conditions. Um, and and their overarch their their overall stated goal was to monopolize. And once you reach a uh, market monopoly, or at least like you're uh, a, a 
valid enough oligopoly or duopoly or an oligopoly, then you can get away with slowly but surely ruining exactly what made you so disruptive and so successful in the first place uh, by slowly but surely lowering the quality of uh, of the delivery mechanism, like when we're talking about Amazon, uh, or, you know, consistently trying to uh, further uh, erode labor protections and consistently and, and very successfully, uh, you know, raising the prices of the product that you're delivering, still the same product, but now it's more expensive. So slowly but surely just like moving the dial uh, year over year and making the, the process more shitty for the consumer and definitely way more shitty for uh, the, the uh, workers every step of the way that uh, produce whatever the products that we're talking about. Indeed. And the, there's a direct correspondence between the time one passes inside one of those platforms. The more you stay in that platform and the more you transact in that platform, the higher your switching costs, the, your cost of switching to another platform. Uh, so, you know, if you're on Twitter and you, 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 you interact a lot, you get, you get more followers like you with Twitch, you have more and more followers. Every follower that is added to your list makes it more expensive for you, okay, uh, to move to another platform because you lose the capital yeah. you've built up, the social capital, right? So as your your switching costs increase, you, the, the degree of exploitation that you suffer from the owner of that cloud capital is increased because he can do it or she can do it without fearing that you will switch because your switching costs have increased. This is a business model. This is why I call this a fiefdom. It's these are not more, it's worse than monopolies, son. Because you know, take you know Ford Motor Company, right? I mean Henry Ford try to monopolize the car business. And to a large extent, he succeeded with maybe competing only against General Motors and a little bit with Chrysler in the good old days. Uh, but he was, firstly, he was building the bloody car that he was selling you. Number one, right? He had, he had skin in the, in the product, so to speak. Secondly, um, he didn't sell you an oven as well. He didn't sell you a book or an electric bicycle at the same time. And moreover, and the, that's the most important thing, the capital he used to produce the Model T was not simultaneously messing with your brain. Because Amazon.com, to give an example, or Uber, it doesn't matter which one we take as an example, the same algorithm that trains you to train it, to train you to train it, to put a desire into your head, sells you the shit as well and extracts 40% from the capitalist who sold it to you. And it is the same algorithm that runs like automata, the workers of Amazon in the warehouses. And it is the same AI algorithm, exactly the same algorithm that predicts with very high probability of success in which warehouse there is a probability, an increased probability of unionization and then shuts that warehouse down or fires everybody. That is not a monopoly. This is why I say, you know, welcome to techno feudalism. This is feudalism. This is not even capitalism. It's not a monopoly. It feudalism is something with, that, with that, additional, uh, with, with so many more resources that previous overlords could not have even imagined, though. The so, capacity to mess with your brain. Yeah. You know, Henry Ford, the, the best Henry Ford could do is to come up with a good ad. That would in, make you want to buy a Ford. Basis uh, of uh, Alexa. Alexa is a dream come true for the KGB. If the KGB had Alexa, they wouldn't need to kill people. You know, if the set, the Gosplan Ministry of Planning in the Soviet Union had uh, the algorithm of Amazon capable of matching individual consumers to individual producers. Central planning would have been a fantastic success. I was just so about to say that, yes. Exactly. <laughs> but uh, the, so that actually is a really interesting point that you just brought up. Because don't you think that the, uh, don't you think that like if we magically had these exact same tools at our disposal, but somehow, um, uh, not even through Clash Struggle, let's say I'm, uh, 
I'm a left com or something all of a sudden. And I think that magically the contradictions uh, caused capitalism to collapse and everyone is a socialist now. Like these, obviously ridiculous, but um, let's say that uh, in, in a situation such as that one, where we had the exact same tools at our disposal, techno feudalism could very quickly, uh, or techno feudalism and all of the surveillance capabilities, AI algorithms would actually make um, would actually make central planning incredibly efficient and very successful. It would be like, uh, I mean, isn't it? Isn't this like uh, the the early uh, assessment before the technology actually caught up to this idea? But this wasn't this like the the attitude in uh, Chile as well. Uh, what was the, the thing that they were working on? The the pro central programming. Cybernetics. Yeah. The cybernetics. Cybersyn, uh, yeah. Uh, absolutely. And it, they did a remarkably good job, even though their machines were very antiquated. Yeah. <laughs> very, not particularly capable. Look, you're absolutely right. Uh, this is a good time to be a socialist who actually believes in uh, in central planning, but, but, but progressive central planning. Central planning, which is uh, very capable of homing in to individual desires, not treating everybody like a grey mass of human yes. beings as the Soviets did. Uh, a libertarian Star Wars-like communism is now possible given the AI programs that are being developed. The problem is that because AI is owned by the 0.001%, it is being used in order to create something closer to Star Wars than Star Trek, you know, a kind of empire striking back and, and creating one war after the other, both within our communities and between our, our societies. So the old lefty vision of um, grabbing the ownership of the means of production, but now it's not just the means of production or distribution or exchange, but it's also the means of communication what I call cloud capital, socializing cloud capital is the only way that the liberal individual can live again. It is the only way that we can be free. You know, otherwise our mind chains will keep us enslaved uh, uh, in the interest of the Jeff Bezos's and the Mark Zuckerbergs of the world. And once we have reclaimed our minds through socializing cloud capital, we can put it to work to create a new cloud capital commons. So imagine instead of the algorithm of Uber uh, being used to exploit drivers and users and our data and all that, imagine if it was in the service of a cooperative uh, which owns the cloud capital and which operates on the basis of, on the basis of you know one worker or one driver, one share, one vote. And imagine that that was the case in every enterprise in every sector then we would have libertarian liberal capitalism sorry yeah. communism. When, when you, when you <laughs> say when that. you say libertarian though uh, it's important to understand the, the distinction between you using the term libertarianism and what americans understand i don't think you're using it in the american anarcho-capitalist uh way you mean libertarian I, and like I, the political theory i use i use it in the old-fashioned anarcho syndicalist fashion where you see the problem with anarcho capitalists is that there's nothing anarchic about them. Yeah, they, no, it's it's built upon an unjustifiable hierarchy. Obviously, the class dynamic there is like it, nobody can supposedly they hate supposedly supposedly they believe in freedom, uh, but the only freedom they truly believe in is the freedom of conglomerates to enslave everyone. That's that's what no. the the millays of the world and the American libertarians. But for me, you see, I. I do believe in libertarian communism in the sense that it sounds like a contradiction. It isn't a contradiction. I mean, Karl Marx was clear he, in, in his hatred of the state. He said that in, under communism, the state would wither. He used the state in order to bring about something like a decentralized uh, commons in which cloud capital and all other kinds of capital are utilized the purposes of enhancing cooperation and shared prosperity well i mean i guess we we deviate a little bit on that front because um i do believe that this state is a necessity at least in the early stages of of transitioning into socialism but um we don't know, give it I agree, with you. I agree with you oh okay of course just, we do yeah i'm talking about i'm talking about i'm talking about the asymptotic case of where we want to get at yeah
Um, so you brought up Millet, and I have a lot of questions uh, from that I fielded from my Discord. Uh, and there are a lot of fans of yours in my community, and they have actually surprisingly come up with really good questions uh, unexpectedly. So I'm going to read one of them to you. Um, uh, this person says, Considering your experience with the IMF and international debt negotiation, I had a few questions for you regarding the current state of Argentina under Malay's administration. By the way, uh, before we get into that, also, if you could elaborate on your experience with the IMF, for those of you who don't know, that could be uh, interesting as well, um, just briefly. Uh, what do you think future negotiations with the IMF will look like under this new government in Argentina? How do you think the IMF will utilize their leverage considering this administration's willingness to cooperate with their demands? What do you think a future administration's plan to tackle this debt should look like? Firstly, my experience, I was elected uh, in 2015 finance minister of Greece at a time when Greece was, uh, well, still is, but uh, it, it had already begun back then, absolutely bankrupt. We were the most bankrupt uh, European country. Uh, and uh, I, uh, there was already uh, an IMF-driven program of massive, massive, inhuman austerity for the many, and largesse for the oligarchs in Greece, uh, and the oligarchs outside of Greece. So my job was to negotiate with the IMF, the European Central Bank, uh, and I only had one objective. And the, my, my own objective was to haircut to delete a large part of the Greek debt, because if you are in debt bondage, then you simply have no sovereignty and you just don't exist. Uh, so th 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 that's my background. Millet, uh, what's his negotiation with the IMF like? Well, it is a negative negotiation. <laughs> it is the opposite of a negotiation. The IMF are complaining, and I have spoken to people in the IMF, with whom I still have some contacts, they are complaining that he is doing too much of what they had asked for. <laughs> so it's a bit like, you know, me and you negotiating, I, I want to buy your house, and you're asking 500,000, and I'm offering you a million. That's <laughs> me lays in the IMF. The IMF asked for a little bit of austerity, he got them three times more austerity. So essentially, he's in a slash and burn mode uh, of essentially increasing the poverty rate to 80 percent, uh, destroying all social and economic opposition to the very few people that he serves, uh, and essentially turning Argentina into a haven for hedge funds, for um, those who will plunder the country, they will dollarize the assets that they will plunder, and the people will be treated like um, you know, surplus to requirements. Uh, a lot of them will have to migrate. That is that 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 is that is what Millet, judging by his actions, seems to be interested in. Now, what should Argentina do? Argentina should default on its debts. And it was a previous administration, which, uh, or two administrations before that, that had absolutely inexcusably, after it was all over, after the original default by Argentina had been accepted by almost everyone, including hedge funds, uh, that cretinous government, who, who, the name of the president escapes me, who is now supporting uh, Millet, uh, essentially, uh, went to the IMF to borrow tens of billions of dollars in order to repay creditors who had lost hope that they would get their money back. And the only reason he did that, he didn't have to do that. The only reason he did it was because debt is power for the rich. He wanted his own government to be even more indebted in order to have an excuse for imposing more austerity on his people because austerity for the many increases the bargaining power of the oligarchs. Won't this inevitably, I mean, the thing is, although it is uh, kept up by uh, international interests, Western interests in general, Western capitals in general, but like, doesn't this only accelerate the demise? I mean, one thing that I see is uh, that uh, under, I guess, like neoliberal regimes all around the world, one thing that we see is that like, the contradictions become, as the contradictions become more apparent to those in the working class, given, I guess, like, uh, 
almost a century of Red Scare propaganda and also uh, concerted efforts uh, from the capital owners completely gutting any kind of like labor solidarity that could have existed or any form that does exist. I feel like there is no counterbalance uh, in, in any of these countries with respect to um, class solidarity and, and also uh, a, a genuine push in the right direction where I feel like we are slowly uh, decaying uh, as capitalism inevitably decays, we are slowly decaying alongside it. And uh, in prior instances, I guess, given the way that uh, the division of labor work, given the assembly line structure that uh, made it more permissible to do some kind of organizing to unite alongside uh, our, our relations to the means of production. I don't see a very positive outcome in all of this beyond uh, our, our at first creeping uh, walk towards fascism and now, you know, bouldering towards fascism that will inevitably restore order in the decay. Do you feel like I'm wrong? Is there a sense of, is there something to no, hold out hope for? We are on the same page. There is no guarantee whatsoever that the immiseration of the working class is going to create class solidarity and a rebound of progressive politics. I, I was young when uh, Margaret Thatcher was doing her thing in the, in the United Kingdom, even before Ronald Reagan started imitating her in the United States. I lived in the, in the United Kingdom. We used to say, I remember when unemployment rose from 700,000 to 4.5 million in a year and a half. 700,000 to 4.5 million in a year and a half. Uh, leftists like myself were saying, oh, well, you know, that will teach the working class in Britain a lesson. Now they will have to respond. No, nope. they did not respond. They became more right-wing. In the end, you know, they, they ended up becoming more nationalist, more xenophobic, uh, or disenfranchised, yeah. or divided, or uh, betrayed by their own political representatives, the Labour Party in the oh, United yeah. Kingdom, the the, Demo the Democrats in the United States. Similarly here, uh, our people here in 2015, was when I was finance minister, put up a remarkable fight. And uh, I have to say that uh, I'm still moved to tears by the manner in which they embraced us when we were doing battle against the oligarchs, against the IMF, against the representatives of financial capital. Uh, six months into our office, my comrade who was prime minister essentially betrayed them. Uh, did a U-turn, overthrew the people, as I say, and uh, signed a deal with the IMF and with the rest. And I was hoping, truly, as I did in 1981 when I lived under Thatcher, that the Greek people, the betrayed Greek people, who had shown such immense courage, would uh, overthrow him in return. They didn't. As I said before, to use the same expression in, that I used in a different context, they privatized their fears, they privatized their despair, pure despair. They were depoliticized, they stopped voting. And um, in the end, when they voted again, it was only between two evils choosing the lesser one in terms of who would give them a hundred bucks more a month in, in the form of some kind of humiliating benefit. Uh, that is why there is no substitute to democratic politics, to organizing, never accepting defeat. There is no final defeat. There is no final victory. There are no guarantees. Uh, we may lose forever. And, you know, in any case, we are facing a climate catastrophe. But as I keep telling my friends and my comrades, I know I'm going to die. That is no reason for me to wake up in the morning and not to have, you know, vivacity and energy and try to make a good day of it. Yeah. Um, one thing, powerful words, one thing that I wanted to tie this into uh, was also brought up by some of the questioners in the Discord was um, anti-immigration. Uh, anti-immigration is, is an issue that you and I uh, align on. Uh, we're both internationalists, uh, or I guess maybe even globalists. I don't know. <laughs> whatever, whatever people uh, consider. Internationalism is different than globalism, yes. It's not about the extraction of... of uh, natural uh, resources from the global south and exploiting them for, uh, you know, developing cheap commodities, but instead about rising everyone uh, up. But um, 
anti-immigration is unfortunately incredibly successful, um, even though, uh, I mean, yeah, it's just incredibly successful. We saw Hillary Clinton look at, even after she lost uh, the election, uh, she, sh she didn't stop talking about this issue. Uh, and, uh, and, and I remember her saying something along the lines of like, Europe needs to cave and capitulate to the right a little bit uh, on their xenophobic sentiment in order to stay in power. Now, at the time, that was a message that was idiotic, in my opinion, and still is idiotic. However, uh, I guess, you know, four, five, six, seven, now eight years later, that message is that message has been heard by neoliberals who are center left or portray themselves as center left, but are actually center right. Uh, Emmanuel Macron has pushed a lot of xenophobic sentiment, very anti-Islam. Islam is seen as like the new villains uh, in Europe, even though they were, I guess, the old villains, the sick man of Europe, the Ottoman Empire, and the like. And um, it, it's it's creating uh, ample ground for genuinely, openly, ideological fascists to, to say, Maybe. see, they agree with us that these immigrants are actually a problem and that we are the solution to that problem. These guys are fake. They're never going to be as cruel and as brutal as we are to the immigrants. We will be, however... And I think that that xenophobia now has is, is led the Democratic Party to also take a similar stance. I don't know if you're familiar, but Joe Biden uh, has been advocating in the most idiotic ways possible for Donald Trump's own border wall, a, a comprehensive uh, white nativist anti-immigration legislation and trying to use that as like a, a, a political tool. And I think that the only lesson that Americans learn who are not super tuned into what's going on is that like, yeah, immigration is a problem. And if immigration is a problem, of course the right is always going to be the ones who have the real solution because the Democrats are supposed to be a counterbalance to that uh, in, our, in our duopoly and in what looks like a duopoly and even parliamentary systems now, like with the uh, Labour uh, Party in the UK. And, and I feel like this is creating ample ground for uh, the rise of genuine fascist parties. And I, I, do, I, I do fear that... Um, I, I don't know how we push back against this. This question is, how can we both push back against the notion that refugees are economically damaging while not falling into the trap of analyzing the world in purely capitalistic economic terms? Um, uh, because to fight this talking point on purely economic grounds is the seed ground of the capitalist that human beings must have economic value to find a place in society. Start. Hillary Clinton's advice to the center left in Europe was not only unethical and ideologically puerile, but it was also stupid from an efficacy point of view. Because let's face it, racism light can never beat full blooded racism. You will never win against racists by presenting racism light. So what Joe Biden is doing now, yeah, you know, being Trump light when it comes to the US uh, Mexican border. Uh, is is a sure recipe for defeat, even if you look at it cynically. Right? That's point number one. Point number two is that, um, look, Hassan, I've been worried about this since uh, the mid-2000s, because as an economist, I could see that the Wall Street collapse, which happened in 2008, was inevitable. And that's when I got really, really scared, because I could see that what was going to happen in Wall Street was another 1929, our generations, my generations, 1929. And what would follow would be, again, a monetary policy that was effectively socialism for the very few, for big business, combined with harsh austerity for the many. I could see that the left, and that includes me, you know, so it's self-critical as well, we would fail would all probably fail to put together a program that excites people and gives them hope, credible in their eyes, and the inevitable result of the discontent that austerity for the many and socialism for the big, big finances and the big business would create would be xenophobia, just like in the mid-war period. I wasn't sure whether it would be the Jews or the Muslims or the Greeks or the Germans that would be the target of the new racists, or all of them together. Yeah. 
know, <laughs> sometimes, you know, the Greeks hate the Germans, the Germans hate the Greeks. Um, everybody has a French. Uh, the anti-Semitism is though. always on their eyes. The, Whatever the happens, anti -Semitism, anti hating the French. Yes, indeed. <laughs> I'm joking, of That's course, right? If that, <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, this is exactly what is happening. Now, my third point, and this is a source of great pain for me personally. I've had um, massive rows with comrades, former comrades on the left, who, for instance, uh, embraced an anti-migration argument, an argument in favor of walls, of electrified fences, of impediments to migration. I think I know who you're talking about, but I won't say. Yeah, let's not say, let's not mention her name. Uh, <laughs> but it's not just one person. Quite oh, a few. I, I, I was thinking of a him, but okay, go on. All right, all right. so let's not mention persons. <laughs> uh, go on. And, 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 you know, and sometimes they often try to couch this in Marxist terms. They even uh, quote a letter that um, Marx had sent to somebody in New York deploring the fact that Irish workers coming to the United States, to New Jersey in particular, and to New York City, they were suppressing the wages of the local proletariat. And they used this as, an, as a reason for creating walls, for stopping migration. But they never quote the second part of the letter by Karl Marx, in which he is very explicit. What he says is, because the solution is not to stop the migrants, from trying to find a place where they can make ends meet, the solution is unionization of the domestic workers along with the migrants. Yes. Right? But my left-wing comrades, a lot of them across Europe and the United States, you'll find it, it's very hard to convince even members of the DSA community with whom I have a very uh, good relationship and I think very highly of them. It's very difficult. They're scared of coming out and say, you mentioned before, you know, once when I, I don't remember, in, in, in some interview I said that uh, borders are a scar on the face of the earth. It's very hard for them to say that. They feel that they are going to be very severely punished. It's don't because they think, think you're that... not realistic when you say that. That's what it is. It's, uh, it's, it, I, I think that's where it comes from. It's like the fear of coming across as like, an idealist and not a realist uh, and, and falling into that same, in my opinion, sorry to call you off, but falling into that same like capitalist trap of capitalist thinking of like, oh, well, this is a part of human nature. Uh, just like greed is a part of human nature, but also uh, a little bit of xenophobia is also a part of human nature. So like in order to gain more allies, like we're, we need to be more pragmatic and uh and and they find themselves unironically advocating for right-wing attitudes reactionary thinking in the throes of reactionary thinking except that i think this is a very lazy form of, of realism and it's not a very good and efficient form of pragmatism because as i said by being racist light you don't win if you come from the left you just lose you lose whatever ethical uh grounds you were standing on yeah that's the more, the, the, the more calculating criticism, but more generally, uh, we of the left have to understand that the only way we are going to succeed in changing hearts and minds is if we say what we believe in and believe in what we say. I have a lot of comrades from, me, from my party, Mera 25, here in Greece, who are running now in the European Parliament elections. And some of them say, you know, who, are, who believe like you and me that, uh, you know, walls are electrified fences are, 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 are just an abomination and need to come down. They do believe it, but they come to me seriously now in our meetings, our, our comms meetings and so on. They say, but Yanis, look, I not to talk about migration because this is, this is our soft underbelly. This is where, you know, we lose points when you speak out against the fence between Greece and Turkey, right? There's a big electrified fence now between Greece and Turkey, which didn't exist until a few years ago. Don't talk about too much. And I say, no, I will talk about it a lot because this is how you distinguish yourself from the rest. And yes, even if what happened to our, to, to our notion of investment, now what is investment? It is a capacity to suffer a cost today in order to gain something tomorrow. So if I, if I, even if, if I lose half of my votes, 
because I, I say what is right. Uh, this is how you educate the public, and this is how you invest in a future in which the public is not scared to say the right thing. Yeah. You, you show them that, uh, you give them, uh, I think, uh, uh, the, the permission to, to be brave uh, when, you, when you lead by example in that regard. When you show them that you're unafraid to say these things, uh, many people will hear you, will listen to your reason, will also have that same shred of empathy and will be courageous enough to also speak on these matters in a similar way. Indeed, indeed. And we need to do this when we are at our lowest ebb, when we are losing. Because if we don't do it whenever we're losing, that is when you have to build the foundation, your moral and ideological foundation. That's when you, you, you need to show that I'm not in it for the office, for the salary that comes with being minister or being um, secretary of state or whatever. I'm here because this is what is right. Now, we need to do this and a lot more of this. And, and, and I'm really appalled that the left has become more scared and more frightened into submission to a narrative that it doesn't believe in. And people sense that. You know, may they, not, may they may not be able to put their finger exactly on it, but they can sense it. So on the one hand, you have the powerful, believe in what they say and they say what they believe in they say you know migrants are uh, scum we're going to shoot them on sight and they do they believe it they yeah so there is this combination of power and conviction on the right and what we have on the left a kind kind of blamange where we are you know semi scared defeated not much power we're not attractive to people it's about time we stiffen our lip yeah um, so one thing, one, I, th I feel like, uh, you and I somewhat agree on the dynamic now in the most reductive terms, being very similar, the political environment being very similar to the early rise of fascism after world war one, um, internationally, uh, we talked about the rise of fascist parties, the old fascist parties, as a matter of fact, with the exact same ideas. Uh, coming into power in places like Italy uh, and and growing its numbers in even places like Spain and uh, and obviously AFD's rise to prominence in Germany, uh, the the uh, reactionary right uh, growing uh, or or I guess like the feckless attitude from uh, the left alternative uh, in the form of the Labour Party in the UK, um, in that environment in the early stages of the development of fascism as we understand it. Uh, I fear, I mean, I feel as though, and, and same with France as well, I feel like there was at least a counterbalance in the form of trade unionism and militant labor activism. Um, and beyond that, there was also obviously the USSR for all of its failures, right? And there were plenty. Um, there was also, um, there was also, a, I guess, almost, and this is going to be undial, uh, not undialectical, but unmaterialist thinking here. There was some, uh, it was almost like a spiritual beacon for many, uh, an example that they could point to that, uh, that they could say like, look, this is happening at, at, with many of uh, many failures, certainly, but there's still something different out there. And, and there was a state that was also even supporting uh, armed resistance against capitalism, armed resistance against fascism uh, globally. And I, I fear that no such counterbalance exists now. Um, or do you think that China is the counterbalance? I don't personally think so. I mean, I don't know. Uh, but but uh, do you feel like there is a, there's a difference here uh, where there is no such alternative, no such state power to facilitate or even to prove that there is a there is a counter to the way that things have existed under capitalism in the Western world for the past 100 years. You're entirely with you. The demise of the Soviet Union was a catastrophe for the West and for the working classes of the West and for the middle classes of the West, even if, even if it, they didn't realize it. Because let's face it, why, why was there a national health service in Britain? Why was there a new deal in the United States? Yeah. Why was there free education for children? 
only because the bourgeoisie, the ruling class in the West, was absolutely terrified that communism was coming. So they, these were uh, acts of retreating in certain regard, regards so as not to lose power. And the moment you saw that, the moment the, 19, the you know the red flag uh, came down from the Kremlin in 1991, all those were taken away. Suddenly there was a rush to take away uh, whatever benefits and public goods had been made available in order to prevent communism from coming to the West. So th this is an interesting dialectical and a very delicious dialectical contradiction. Uh, the West, by the capitalist West, by invading the Soviet Union in its very early days, it created a realm of fear and terror inside the, the Soviet Union that led to the rise of Stalin, to the Gulag and so on. So the West caused the, the Soviet Union to become barbaric to a very large extent. But the Soviet Union civilized the West. <laughs> that's yeah. that's my, my way of thinking about it. But let me talk about fascism here. The fascism of the mid-war period compared to the fascism today. Because there are many similarities. I made the point that uh, our 1929-2008 paved the ground for the rise of the fascists that you refer to, the Orbans, the Melonis, the Le Pens, the Alternative for Deutschland, the right-wing Brexiteers, Donald Trump, uh, Modi in India. Golden Dawn and the new democracy here in Greece and so on and so forth. But there is a fundamental difference. One you mentioned, there was a strong trade union movement in the 1920s and 30s, which doesn't exist today. That you mentioned, I don't I need to mention it myself. But there was also something else. The fascist parties, because of the strong union movement and the strong left wing, social democratic, communist parties, anarchists in uh, uh, in Spain and so on. Uh, because of that, the industrial capitalists, the industrialists, finance directly the fascists. So Mussolini and Hitler would never have gotten into power if it was not for the big business, the industrial capitalists, that actually saw in the fascists a way, a bulwark against uh, the, the left. Can what, can I can I interject here as well? Because uh, this is a this is a complementary point to the to the testament of the strength of militant labor uh, movements that the early fascists before they uh, completely openly uh, subscribe to fascism also portrayed themselves as socialists or uh, well not real socialists but like they used the the very the very yeah the very popular agenda of of uh economic socialism i guess without actually ever subscribing to it of course but they still use that as a as a as yes. a means to to galvanize their base or to bring more people onto their base something that i think tucker carlson has utilized as well as a matter of fact in like in american propaganda where sometimes he'll say things where you're like you're you're confused by like he he sees the writing on the wall and will regularly use leftist thinking economic populism donald trump did this as well as a matter of fact um like true economic populism in order to to develop a base of support without ever actually giving that base the things that he promised and just uh you know only hyper focusing on the nationalistic components as a means of control indeed Let's not forget that Mussolini started life as a socialist. Yeah. And he was the first political leader in Europe to introduce a fully fledged pension system, um, non contributory pension system. Uh, if you read, and I had spent uh, prior to writing a book, what, 15 years ago about Europe, I had spent a, a, a large and very painful. Uh, part of my life, reading everything that um, Goebbels had written between 1920 and 1933. Uh, it was fascinating. They were all, everything, everything he had written was four pages. Uh, everything was four pages. It had a four-page format. The first two pages I could have written. 
The first two pages were a critique of capitalism, of financial capitalism, of bankers, of, you know, the way, the, the exploitation of workers, uh, the, the cultural aspects of commodification. I could have written it. I wish I had written it. And then suddenly, so what do we do? We kill the Jews, right? That's the, second, the, the bottom yeah. of the second page, or into the third and the fourth one. Okay. Similarly, uh, Mussolini, if you read his speeches, especially just before he took over power, what was the deal, the covenant that he was presenting the Italian people? It was, you have been treated like shit. There are these rich bastards, the industrialists, the bankers, the this, that, and the other, that are selling out the country, and you in particular. And I'm offering you the following deal. You will give me absolute power, forget democracy, trade unions, voice, representation, and all that rubbish. You give me absolute power, and I will look after, after you. And indeed, he looked after them. He gave them pensions. He tripled the minimum wages. What Orban has done he in Hungary, made you know, the trains has... run on time, right? That's what they say. Yeah, but, but more than that, he actually gave money in, like, in the same way that Viktor Orban did in Hungary. You know, he tri trebled the, the minimum wage first day. What, are, what social gov democratic government do you know that has done that? None, ever, ever. Okay, so you are absolutely right. But the, the, the trade off is no voice, no democracy, no representation. And then what he, these fascists used to do is then take the masses that owed them for having been looked after by them and sell them to the industrialists. Say, essentially, do a deal, a cooperatist deal. Now, that was then in the mid-war period. After the our generations, 1929, 2008, that didn't happen. And it didn't happen for the reasons that you have outlined. Firstly, we don't have the strong trade unions, we don't have a strong left. The ruling class are not worried about the left, so they don't have to do any of this. But there is something else as well. The power has shifted away from industrial capital. The industrialists were no longer in control of capitalism. After the end of Bretton Woods in 1971, and by the time Ronald Reagan had taken over, under the stewardship of the Federal Reserve by um, Paul Volcker, power had shifted from the industrial sector to the financial sector, to Wall Street, in the United States, but also in Europe, increasingly. So even if I made you president or prime minister in the 1980s and 90s, you couldn't do a deal between the working class and the industrialists because the industrialists didn't have the power, they didn't have the money. It was the bankers that did. And it is impossible to cut a deal between the financiers and the workers. Or today, the cloud capitalists or cloud as a common. How, imagine a, a government sitting down Jeff Bezos on the one hand and the precariat on the other and saying, we'll cut a deal between you. It's just simply impossible. Phys physically, it's not possible because of the way that production, exchange, and distribution has been uh, uh, evolving due to technological change. So instead, the fascists put all their eggs in the, in, in the basket of xenophobia. Okay, They cannot promise you to look after you. I mean, Donald Trump promised it and didn't deliver. And in the end, the only thing that really happens in the dynamic is this. They whip up discontent through the language of Carson, of uh, Trump, of Meloni in Italy. They win power in order supposedly to serve the people, and then they deliver tax cuts to the very rich, especially to the financiers. And then at that point, they get blunted their own power. So Meloni remains in power in Italy only because she's cut a deal with the establishment essentially not to be different at all to the previous regime, to the Mario Draghi government, which is really interesting because it's a bit like what happened to the government in which I was minister. After I left, uh, the, my former comrades that remained in government, who had agreed, they had effectively surrendered to the powers that be fully, uh, they also did exactly what right-wing governments would have done, only with a left-wing tinge, a little bit of pink somewhere, you know. Uh, and, of course, at that point, the system spits them out, vomits them out. And I think that these fascists will also be vomited out by the system that incorporates them 
because there is no industrial capital, there are no trade unions, and no government anymore has the capacity to cut a deal, whether it is a national socialist Nazi deal or a social democratic deal. So I think we're, we're done with all that. Now we have the radical center. We simply have a kind of feudalism with the mediocracy, the, <laughs> the media autocracy, and you know, people that are fragmented, the fragmented, precariat, cloud serfs, as I call them, cloud proles, the precariat. Uh, as far as China is concerned, because you mentioned China before, let me say that I think that China is a remarkable experiment. Uh, it's a work in progress. I don't think we can say China is like this. Whatever we say after China is, is wrong. Because China is many things. Uh, from some personal experience I have, there are remarkable left-wing voices in the Chinese Communist Party. Very, very astute minds and very progressive people who, with whom you, you, know, you would find a lot in common. Not everything, but a lot in common. Uh, and they represent workers, cooperatives, uh, prefectures and so on. But in the same Communist Party Central Committee, you have representatives of big business. You know, the aluminium producers that I was taking, talking about before. Yeah. You know, the cloud capitalists. The more, so more the billionaires than any other party on the planet, <laughs> sitting active yeah. party uh, members. <laughs> but, but that's what I'm saying. The class struggle in China is happening within the Central Committee of the Communist Party. And of course, it's completely behind closed doors. It's totally opaque to us to know what, what is going on. That is a great disadvantage because opacity is never um, a friend of progress. But it is an interesting uh, ex a, a, a experiment. Let me give you another example. At some point, President Xi decided that the cloud, the cloud delists, as I call them, the owners of cloud capital, the big tech of China, became too rich and too powerful. So he slapped them down. Yeah. And he got rid of them. He said, no, 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 no. We've given you the right to get rich, but not that rich. So Jack Ma, you can be a billionaire. Bugger off. You're out of Alibaba. <laughs> you know, this, is, this is interesting. I wish we could have a system where instead of the, auto, the autocrat who occupies the position of the general secretary of the Communist Party, you know, we could have a citizens assembly or, you know, representatives of workers playing that role of slapping down those who acquire too much capital and therefore too much power to extract. Okay. That's, I mean, I, I, I agree with what you're saying. Uh, maybe I also like the, uh, the visually, I like the idea of like uh, the central committee having uh, closed door Maoist struggle sessions internally, where they're, they're humiliating the counter revolutionary uh, billionaires potentially um, for, for engaging in counter revolutionary sentiment. Um, I just, I, we have no way of understanding what, uh, the Chinese government is going to look like in the next 10 years. I don't think, I, and I, that's why it's so funny when people always say like, oh, China is slated to collapse like tomorrow. Uh, not understanding that like, uh, it's, it's that well, you, you scoff at this as an economist, but the, the sentiment of those who, uh, at least like care to follow China, even from a negative perspective is almost always what I'm describing to you. If you go on YouTube and you search China, there are a million essays. If you go on foreign policy magazine, even though their attitude has shifted they recently, are the party line. They, are, they are following the party line. This is the Washington consensus, the Washington yeah. party line. At some point, the, the, it's amazing. We don't need in the United States, a KGB. We don't need a communist party or a yes. capitalist party, a reactionary party, because it operates as if there is one. You don't yeah. actually. No, people do it for free. The of there is a party line. Suddenly, they all become anti-Chinese. All the analysts who were pro uh, proclaiming China as the great capital success story, suddenly they are dumping on it, all of them together. Yeah. That is not because something changed in China. That's because there's a new line, a new party line. Yeah. It's, it's very interesting to see that. I mean, it, that, that can be uh, talked about in every respect of even leftist organizing. Something is like, a, even when you look at the microcosm uh, of, of like leftist organizing, uh, in the past we needed, uh, the American government needed uh, COINTELPRO, right? That was a thing that, uh, that the, the federal government openly utilized espionage to infiltrate leftist groups, to subvert them, 
and to cause division and to either take over or eliminate them, right? And to spy on them and surveil on them. And yet nowadays, like, I don't think there is espionage of that sort. I don't think that the intelligence communities are engaging in that because people do it to themselves anyway. People have adopted those aesthetics so firmly that, like, uh, there is genuine momentum from those who consider themselves to be, like, leftists who uh, or consider themselves to be uh, socialists of, of uh, different varieties, constantly infighting and, and uh, finding new methods of, of sowing uh, division, wrecking in the old party terminology. We, we are engaging in wrecking behavior all the time without even recognizing that we're doing it. Mm -hmm. We're volunteering our um, views uh, to the owners. But at the same time, I have to tell you that as somebody who has, uh, and that is official, this is not my, it's not hearsay and it's not my allegation. I've got a three, three point NSA tap on me because of my relationship with Julian Assange. <laughs> that has been established in the Madrid court in Spain. Um, I have to say that um, the national security apparatus of the United States, even though you and I are volunteering our data through Amazon, through Google and so on, uh, they do not rely on big tech. They have their own equipment. They have their own systems because they understand better than anyone that their own power within the hegemonic space that the United States has created over the last 70 years depends on large scale capital belonging to them. They believe in state ownership of cloud capital with them at the controls. Yeah, they but, understand that. But they're still operating <laughs> at the behest of capital owners though, right? Like I, I feel like in the most reductive terms, like the Chinese government owns the corporations, whereas in America and in Western capitalist nations, the corporations still own the government. So all the decision-making from the states, usually in the Western world, are done to advance the interests of the capital-owning class as a whole. But don't, don't deny agency to the agents. <laughs> they have some agent. Let me, let me give you an example. Uh, in the 1960s, the American car industry was in the process of being wrecked by Japanese imports. Oh, yeah. And the United States could easily have slapped tariffs to prevent Toyotas and Mazdas and Hondas from coming into the country, right? They didn't. And it, it, that wasn't because they believed in free trade, but because they had a plan, a plan for using Japan as a proxy for United States power in East Asia. And they wanted a very strong industrial pylon supporting the American dollar in East Asia. And they understood that fully well. I've read transcripts in the Senate, committee hearings, and so on and so forth. And because they had failed in securing China as a vital space where the, China, the Japanese cars would be sold, they had to absorb them into the United States. So they actually went to General Motors and they went to Ford and said, okay, listen, we are going to let them in. That will decimate you, but don't worry. We will give you huge defense contracts and other ways of financializing yourself. So you ended up with General Motors becoming a financial company and not a car company. So that's what I mean. They serve the interests of corporate capital, but sometimes they go against what corporate capital instructs them to do because some of the smarter people in Washington know the interests of corporate America better than corporate America does. Oh, yeah. No, it still serves because what you just described is still obviously imperialism, which I believe is a necessity under capitalism. So I think that it served the interest of American imperialism, even in the short term, if it did not serve the interests of uh, American capitalists, at least in certain sectors. Marx had put it beautifully in the 18th Brumiere when he said that the state, which is the organ of the bourgeoisie, nevertheless has to wield the Damocles sword over the heads of the bourgeoisie in the bourgeoisie's interests. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they do, the, they do the, the hard stuff sometimes, even if, uh, even if people don't see it, even if they don't have the understanding of an agenda, which, by the way, 
is yet another argument uh, for, uh, you know, the state uh, operating in some way. Uh, that's why I, I think it's laughable to say that, like, the American state is, is disorganized or rather there is no central planning of some sort. Uh, after all, our agricultural industry would not exist without severe subsidies, and that's a deliberate uh, mechanism of the state to continue pushing in certain directions, whether it be our, our interest in fossil fuels, uh, in the way that we subsidize uh, our, uh, our energy sector. I believe uh, up until maybe like 2016, 2017, 85% of subsidies were still going to fossil fuel uh, providers. So that's like... I think that our state is still operating at the behest of corporations, even when it doesn't seem like it uh, in the in the short term. And some of those, I think some of those decisions, some of those gambles that we're making are short sighted in comparison to how the Chinese state operates as they uh, very quickly seized on renewable energy as the as as a, as an important sector uh, and as a growing as a as a growing sector. Um, Partially, they probably couldn't uh, engage in the same level of control over fossil fuel, the fossil fuel sector, even though they had, I guess, coal. Uh, but they, they couldn't do that for, for oil, so they maybe moved in a pragmatic fashion towards um, working with uh, like the, res the countries that are very resource-dense as far as you know, lithium and many of the minerals that we desperately need for both, um, both batteries and, and, uh, and the like. But I feel like they are making the right gamble uh, as a state, whereas the Western states are making the wrong gamble and are maybe uh, maybe too far gone to recognize that. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. Look, if, if you want to take an even, you know, even a quite right wing perspective on this, uh, you come to the same conclusion that the Chinese Communist Party needs development of its people in order to maintain its legitimacy. The United States system doesn't need that. It simply seeks uh, the reproduction of uh, the capital of the corporate sector. That's all they need. Uh, they get their uh, capacity to reproduce themselves politically through this full democracy, this pretend democracy, with periodic elections that um, are designed to make sure that the demos is never allowed into the American democracy. Uh, and at the same time, they extract uh, about 70% of the rest of the world's capitalist profits, uh, which is recycled through Wall Street. So the Chinese simply looked around and they tried to imagine what the next fuel is. It's not going to be oil. It's going to be solar, and it will be wind, and it will be fission. And they're investing like hell on that. Uh, so, you know, the Americans, the only thing that keeps the United States system going is the monopoly of the dollar system. They understand that. That's why they will, you know, this is, they will nuke anyone <laughs> who tries to, <laughs> to, 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 to subsume or to subvert the power of the dollar. That we must remember. So speaking of de-dollarization, I guess, I have heard uh, some of the things you've said about BRICS nations, which I, I think is, is uh, hailed up as, uh, as an alliance that it will inevitably destroy American currency and, and the power that it holds. I, I, don't, I am not as big as a BRICS believer uh, as I feel like you aren't either, uh, no. especially considering that like this allegiance is not held by any ideological underpinning these are these are countries that are even ironically at uh in conflict with one another uh, at least the i and the c are in conflict with one another uh with regular frequency um so what do you have to say to the to the BRICS defenders like what is your assessment for those of you who don't know uh in the chat about uh the development of BRICS? while you also answer that i'm gonna run to the bathroom real quick if you don't mind Go ahead. I will talk to our audience. Go ahead. Yeah, there's there's yeah. twenty five thousand people listening to what you have to say. Oh, hello, forty five thousand people. <laughs> okay, so I think that commentators, establishment commentators on the right, underestimate the importance of the BRICS, and my left wing comrades 
overestimate the importance of the BRICS. They have, we have, I mean, I would like to see that happening, except that I don't believe it will happen. We would like to see uh, an alternative pole of socioeconomic power and geopolitical power emerging in order to counterbalance American imperialism. And, you know, those who, st who still yearn after the Soviet Union, who are nostalgic about the Soviet Union with all its faults, as Hassan said, and they thought that, you know, quite rightly so, that it was a counterbalance for the United States power. And they would like to say, OK, well, BRICS is the new USSR. Well, it isn't. And I think Hassan mentioned some of the reasons why it isn't. Uh, there is no uh, common political economy. What is the relationship between the political economy of South Africa, Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia which is now entering the BRICS, um, Russia, India and China? They are just completely different uh, kettles of fish. They are in conflict with one another. The most important aspect, however, of BRICS is a common cause they have. And that is the fear of what I was saying before, the power of the United States bestowed upon it, upon the, the United States, by the monopoly of international payments. So if you want to make international payments, you're stuck with the dollar these days. Uh, the Chinese, again, as I was alluding to before, the Chinese have created a new superhighway for international payments, which Indian oligarchs, Saudi Arabian oligarchs, Russian oligarchs, Indonesian oligarchs, Malaysian oligarchs, of course, people from, you know, the sheikhs from the United Arab Emirates, they would like to have access to, just in case this is hedging their bets. They don't want to put all their eggs into the dollar system. That is what, if you look at the BRICS now, what is the interesting part of what the BRICS do? It is the BRICS payment system, which is an alternative to SWIFT. It's an alternative to the dollar system. Uh, that's very interesting. Uh, what else are they doing, which is interesting? They're creating uh, an alternative to the IMF uh, for the purposes of lending. Before Millet was elected in Argentina, uh, one of the... Uh, the, the, the uh, bonds that uh, was maturing by Argentina and Argentina had to pay to the IMF was paid for by a loan granted by the Chinese government to the Argentinian government in Argentinian pesos, which meant essentially that the Chinese, who knew, of course, that the Argentinian peso would depreciate relative to the dollar, essentially they were taking the risk of the dollar of the Argentinian peso in repaying part of the debt of Argentina to the IMF. Now, why would the Chinese do that? They, they, it's not philanthropy. It's an attempt to bolster this alternative payment and banking system, alternative to the dollar. That is what they have in common. Now, people say, oh, Yanis, does this mean that this is going to be a common currency? No, there can never be a common currency. To have a common currency, <clears> you need to have a common capacity to tax, a common capacity to borrow. So for me, for me, the BRICS is an interesting experiment whereby the C, China, creates the financial system and the B, the R, the I, the S, and all the other letters uh, representing countries that have not entered the BRICS yet, but are in the process of entering, including Saudi Arabia and so on, will be using that system. Now that friends on the left must understand is not an alternative ideological block like the USSR was. It has very interesting repercussions regarding the monopoly of the dollar and therefore the American capacity to project geopolitical power around the world. Uh, but it is work in progress. Uh, there are interesting aspects to it, but there's no guarantee that working people are going to benefit from it. Because let's face it, all these capitalists in the BRICS countries still have most of their money in the dollar system and they want to keep it in the dollar system. Because if you are a producer of BYD cars in the United in China, one of your investors is Warren Buffett. You want to sell them to the Americans. <clears throat> Why would you sell them to the Americans? Because the Americans have a great trade deficit. So the trade deficit of the United States is like a vacuum cleaner sucking BYD cars in the United States. And what do you get? You get dollars, right? So the BRICS payment system and so on for you is a backup mechanism, even if you're a Chinese capitalist. It's this leverage. is what my friends 
That is, yes, this is what my, so unless the working class of China appropriates control of the BRICS payment system, it's good that the BRICS payment system will be created, but then we need the second step. The working class of China, of India, of uh, South Africa and so on, to appropriate this BRICS payment system and make it work for them, not for the capitalists. Yeah, I mean, maybe with the this this therein lies the the question of of whether there is a genuine ideological commitment to socialism presented by China, where uh, they would allow such a thing to happen. If there's only if there's one country that, in my opinion, has the capacity to do such a thing, it would be China. It definitely, I don't think it would be India. Um, no. India, no. I feel like is is seen. On, it depends on how the class war plays out in China. Okay. It will depend who wins the class war in China. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, what do you what do you think about um, this? Is not necessarily an argument, but it's just like something I think about a little bit uh, with respect to comparing India's development to to China's development and how differently things have played out. They're both in to different uh, degrees, uh, post colonial countries in some respects that have been harmed by. Uh, Western colonial interests, and yet uh, one country seemingly is in the throes of fascism and is uh, very much in favor uh, by the Western capitalists as like as they present India not only as a emerging market but also as like a beacon of of I guess capitalist development. Uh, they are I feel like they're they're definitely seen as like an ally by Western capitalists. In a way that now China is not. China is presented as a threat, and yet when you look at the even development in China in comparison to uh, no such uh, even development in India, I feel like ideology plays a role there. No, I mean, or, or I guess like the interest of the government plays a little bit of a role there. But it does, of course, it does. Uh, look, India is a, also a work in progress, uh, but you're right. The fundamental difference is that it's not incorporated in the international recycling system, a system of recycling surpluses and deficits. India is um, a deficit country without a huge deficit, a lot of poverty. Uh, there is industrialization, but at the same time, there is so much cronyism and oligopolistic power, which is unchecked by government. It's a weak government. It's a government that only manages to, 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 to gain such large percentages by essentially um, fermenting ethnic rivalries and uh, oppression of one ethnic group by another ethnic group. This is not how the Chinese Communist Party did its uh, accomplished its, its own management of the social economy of China. Already you see that before there was substantial development in India, the degree to which you have cartels forming that are extracting huge quantities of value from the middle class and the petty bourgeoisie and taking the money out of India. For instance, you know, buying the government of the United Kingdom as well as its industry. <laughs> you know, Jaguar belongs to the Indians now. Um, and diversifying around the world before, not like the Chinese who created a very strong industrial matrix with all sorts of products becoming uh, uh, very competitive uh, across the world and then extending its power or spreading its wing outside of China. You have few oligarchs in India who are already taking their money out of it, India and using the... Um, the fascistic government of Modi in order to keep everybody under a lid. So the developmental power of India, which is great, uh, is not being harnessed. Not yet. And the political game and the way it plays out is going to be essential in determining the chances of India, of the Indian working classes, for uh, a modicum of shared prosperity, which the Chinese have su succeeded in acquiring. Isn't this a testament that, or isn't this a lesson for uh, Western nations to pay attention to as far as, and it's it's one that I, uh, 
here being channeled by uh, the European Union, as a matter of fact, I uh, that that um, state controlled economies are are impossible to combat through uh, impossible to combat in the global marketplace, especially if they reach a level of development where they can compete with like uh, where they, I guess, can compete with American interests and, and Western interests in general, uh, that that it is uh, virtually uh, impossible to to go up against them because of how much control they have over their industrial output um like they are not as they're not as weak uh to, and and susceptible to uh, the boom and bust cycle that uh capitalist forms of governance are um one example i'll use i guess is the like you mentioned the byd uh cars right uh, the electric vehicles are just far too cheap for uh european uh industry to compete with and this has become such a obvious uh this has become such an obvious issue for uh europe possibly led by the uh, german industrialist interests here uh to to put an end to uh, the the almost invasion of of uh very cheap very affordable chinese electric vehicles um i remember i mean i think well someone in the chat just linked this uh, uh, as well, uh, Janet Yellen talking about China's overproduction of clean energy goods need to be mitigated. <laughs> um, and yeah. I think the EU said something along the lines of, uh, we have to do something about like subsidizing Chinese EV development because they are absolutely gutting our, uh, like gutting the space that we had assigned for European car manufacturers. Okay. Uh, let me add to what you said and then take a position. Before 2009, 2008, 2009, the line across Europe, the party line, and to a very large extent in the United States, was that China can never be a threat because even though they are very good at copying what we do and our technologies, uh, you know, it's a good place to subcontract our second rate production lines because, um, you know, they, they can produce en masse all the technologies. And because they are a centrally planned, communist-led government, they can never innovate. And then they innovated, and then they changed their tune. <laughs> yeah. But uh, beyond that, it's not that the Chinese innovated. After the 2008 financial crash, when we had in April of 2009, the great and the good of the G7 presidents and prime ministers and central bankers gathering in London under the chairmanship of Gordon Brown, who was the prime minister of Britain then, in order to, 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 to decide to agree amongst themselves the great bailout of the bankers. They printed $35 trillion between 2009 2020, and they handed it over to the financiers. And at the same time, they practiced austerity. So if, let's say you are Volkswagen in Germany. Uh, the phone rings and it's Deutsche Bank. We've just been given a few billion from the European Central Bank just that day to disperse, to, to lend. You're Volkswagen and this, your bank is giving this money away to you for free. Take billions, billions, take it now. Billions, no interest rate. Why would Deutsche Bank give it away for no interest rate? Because it was getting it from the European Central Bank at negative interest rates. So Deutsche Bank was making money by giving away money, billions for free to Volkswagen, right? But the people in Volkswagen who were not stupid, right? They looked at people around Europe who were struck by, hit by austerity and had, they were impecunious. They said, yeah, as if we are going to, to, to you know, to invest in new EV vehicles, the you know, equivalent of Tesla, or fancy new cars, products, whatever. These people won't be able to buy it. So they took the money from Deutsche Bank because it was free, and they took it to the Frankfurt Stock Exchange and they bought Volkswagen shares. That's not investment. Hmm. So to cut a long story short, Hassan, between 2009 and 2022, there was no investment in, in Germany. Zero. The, the the thing that you Zero. just mentioned is a product. I mean, is a is a financial tool that I here in the United States of America am, of course, very familiar with, uh, considering that that has been the the entire 
uh, the the entire financial transaction for virtually every single massive American corporation since the Reagan era. The process that you described being illegal before the Reagan era, stock buybacks. Yeah, that's what they did. So they didn't invest. Meanwhile, the Chinese were investing as if there is no tomorrow. They boosted their gross capital formation, the actual percentage of income invested from an already outrageously high 30% to 50%. They built about 22,000 miles of super fast trains. You know, they invested massively in battery technology, right? So today, they can produce a remarkable car that is nicer than, better than Tesla, you know, for $30,000. Not saying when much, Tesla, Tesla sucks. <laughs> Sorry. Right? <laughs> so, Volkswagen, who has no access to rare earths, no access to battery technology, they have to buy all that from China, they cannot compete. And then they're kicking and screaming, and they're screaming blue murder, that the Chinese are, uh, are, are practicing, you know, they, they're using unfair trade practices. Rubbish. They haven't been investing for two decades while you were asleep at the wheel doing share buy. Uh, no, absolutely. Um, yeah, these, this is very interesting to, to think about. Um, okay, I, I've had you here for uh, two hours now, two hours plus, and uh, thank you so much for uh, all the time you gave this community. Uh, I have a couple last questions. Let me think. Uh, there was another thing I wanted to bring up here. Mm, I think it was about, not about investment, but uh, oh, shit. The conversation about stock buybacks just uh, broke my brain a little bit. People want me to ask you about loot boxes and what you think about. There's a lot of there's a lot of uh, steam valve uh, interest in this community for understandable reasons. This is a you know we are this is a gaming platform that we're on primarily. Um, U.S. economic allies? No, that's not what it is. Uh, yeah, okay. What do you what do you think about loot boxes? <laughs> I don't know much about it because you see, I I cut my my links since I left there. Uh, my job, let me tell you what it was. My job was to study their economy. Uh, they had no idea of how that economy worked. It had spontaneously emerged. They had never planned it. They had never designed it. It was just a perfect example of what Hayek referred to as spontaneous order. And I went there and tried to, to to study the dynamics of price formation. Uh, of uh, the probability of bubbles uh, inflating and then deflating very suddenly and creating damage to the player communi community, uh, how the trading rooms should work in order to minimize the costs of um, uh, subterfuge by people who were leaving and going to eBay. That, that, you know, I spent there one year. That's what I learned. And then I moved on. Then I, you know, then I had uh, to negotiate with the IMF as the failed finance minister of the most bankrupt European state. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, let me ask you, this is a silly questions. Uh, now, uh, what do you have to say to those? Uh, I personally think this is a very uh, reactionary uh, uh, response to anyone and everyone that is even like remotely presenting of like progressive causes. But one thing that we see in the United States of America is this notion that socialism implies that you have to live a very ascetic lifestyle, uh, that socialism and success are not aligned uh, with one another. You brought up uh, something inadvertently without even probably realizing, but you said, uh, oh, what if I'm selling you a house for 500000 You're selling me a house for $500,000 and I'm offering you $1 million. Um, I... For, uh, I, you probably don't know this, but I am an owner of a house. I'm living inside of it right now. This is seen as a, uh, a an unimaginable sin by those who have no understanding of socialism. What do you think about the the notion that socialism and and uh, and being uh, successful or being affluent cannot uh, coexist? Well, you see, the whole point about being a socialist is wanting everybody to be well off Thank and not, not wanting anyone anyone to be a victim of exploitation now that in my case i have a very nice house here where i am uh, i can see it's a very wonderful kitchen 
a very nice place. Especially if you saw the view during the day outside. It, I am, uh, you know, my privilege is bordering on the sinful. Um, the question is: Are you prepared? If if needs be, are you prepared to downsize, to give it up, so as to live under circumstances of shared prosperity? And the the, the answer must be yes. Yeah. And it is yes. Uh, do I feel guilty that my income is above the median income? No, because I don't think socialism would be uh, promoted if um, if I fell below the median. If it were to be promoted, I would do it. And one final point. We Marxists, we are not against the products of capitalism, of the production line. We, against, we are against the social relations of production, which confine ownership of those machines to the 0.001%, and the rest become slaves of that 0.001%. I'm not going to, 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 to smash my phone because it, you know, it is an instrument for Jeff Bezos, and I'm not going to smash my motorcycle, particularly my motorcycle, with which I'm in love, uh, because it was produced by Yamaha. There I plugged Yamaha as well. Um, and one final point, if I may. When we fought for uh, equal civil rights in the deep south of the United States, we did, some of us, or against apartheid in South Africa, or against what's happening now in Gaza, we were privileged. Well, you know what? It takes a little bit of privilege to have the time and the capacity to dedicate yourself to that struggle. Because if I were an Uber driver, you know, driving 15 hours a day in order to put food on the table for my children, I wouldn't be able to have this conversation with you today. I wouldn't be able to write books. I wouldn't be able to agitate. I wouldn't indeed have the power to run for elections. Uh, okay, so let's not fetishize wealth, but not fetishize poverty at the same time. To be rich is to be glorious. <laughs> In the words of Deng Xiaoping. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, no, but yes, we have another know. thing. We have another thing in common. Do you know what we have in common? What do we have in common? We've been speaking for two hours and our dogs have been asleep next to us. Yeah, well... Yours behind you. Mine over there. It's because, <laughs> it's because she... I, I work her out in the morning, uh, every morning. Well, your, your dog is sleeping because it's 1 a.m. over there, but um, my dog is sleeping because she ran a lot this morning and I have to do that because I stream for eight hours every day. Um, agitating and propagandizing to the best of my ability. My dog does the same thing, you know, during the day after a big run in the morning, a lot of zooming and a lot of sleeping by my dog next to me. So I'm familiar with your circumstances. Yeah. Well, Giannis, thank Thanks you so for much. Me. Thank you so much thank for you. coming on. This was phenomenal. I've been a big fanboy of yours for uh, quite some time. I hope I wasn't uh, uh, too annoying. And uh, also, I want to give a shout out to uh, Evout from the Netherlands, who's a big fan of mine, apparently, and was really keen on making this uh, chat happen. It was a little bit difficult, I, I will admit, to like uh, go a little back and forth and, and uh, secure a time slot, especially with the international time zone uh, difference. Yeah. But I uh, just wanted to give them a shout out. That's what DM25 uh, asked <laughs> in the DMs. Um, and... And I, I am very world. glad that it happened finally. Uh, are you are you coming to America anytime soon? Are you coming to LA anytime soon? Not anytime soon. We have European Parliament elections in June, and we are running here in Germany and Italy because we are true internationalists. We are the only people who are running in different countries at the same time. Uh, and after that, I think I'm going to collapse during the summer and head for the United States in the autumn. Oh, okay. Well, maybe you know who knows. Maybe I'll maybe I'll be in your neck of the woods sometime. Um, uh, so is there anything you want to, you want to mention? Is there anything you want to plug before, uh, we leave? Two things, if I may. First, let's all remain vigilant about the slow murder of Julian Assange, my great friend who is in the Belmars prison, uh, for revealing the crimes our governments have performed, have committed in our name behind our backs. And secondly, 
let me say that next week I'm going to go to your town in Istanbul. Oh wow! Okay. Um, speak to comrades there, um, and I think you and I should join forces, amongst other things, in order to bring about greater greater solidarity amongst progressives in our two countries. I, I agree, one hundred percent. As long as you give us baklava, as long as you say baklava is Turkish. Okay. <laughs> it's in Greek as well. We have the same oh, word. Oh, no. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so Security. much for coming on. All right. That was Giannis Varoufakis, ladies and gentlemen, boys, girls, and MBs.